Purchase new wiper blades from O'Reilly Auto Parts today and we'll install them for free. See better and drive safer with O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. Hey, you guys. My one-woman show, Surviving the Ride, is coming to Portland, Oregon on Saturday, December 8th at the Clinton Street Theater. I'll be sharing true stories about my career as a flight attendant and my journey to and through the Peace Corps and then facing death head on. Come on down to see me on Saturday, December 8th at the Clinton Street Theater in Portland, Oregon. Tickets are available now for only $12 in advance or $15 the night of the show. You can get your tickets at christineblackburn.com, storyworthypodcast.com, or at the theater website, cstpdx.com. That's cstpdx.com. And stick around after the show. I'd love to meet you guys. Hey, it's Christine from Storyworthy. Today on the show, actress Jenna Brister shares a terrifying story about going to Christian summer camp and almost losing her life. And I remember laying there and thinking, what's the worst that could happen to me? Like, this is fine. I'm at, I'm at Bible camp. You know, everything's cool. And so at the same time, I'm thinking I need to not do this and stand up because I can get severely injured because it hurts being launched in a lake, landing on water. And so it's going to hurt a lot more landing on a field. Today on Storyworthy, actress Jenna Brister talks about a Christian summer camp that was anything but Christian. Stay close. Hey, it's Jenna Brister, and you are listening to Storyworthy. Welcome to Story Worthy. My name is Christine Blackburn, and I'm coming to you from Los Angeles, California. Whether you're a longtime fan of the show or a new listener, welcome to Story Worthy. I hope you guys had a chance to listen to the show last week, which was Story Smash from October 27th. Jenna, you were on this show. I was. That was a fun night. <laughs> yeah, it was an amazing night. Yeah. <laughs> now, it hasn't happened yet, but it's going to have been. It's just that we're recording at this funny <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> I'm just that confident. I'm that confident in the show and the lineup and the judges panel. Well, that's the thing. It's such a fun format. It really is. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. I'm really glad. And you're it's always really cool. such a good contestant. Oh my God, really. it's so fun. You are super good. You're very quick oh. on your feet. So go back, you guys, and listen to Story Smash last week because honestly, that show gets it's better and better and tighter and tighter. Mm-hmm. Uh, but not now, not now, because today we're here with Jenna Brister, Yay! who, like I said, was just on Story Smash. And you are so talented, Jenna. Oh, that is so sweet. You Thank you. You really are. So nice. You are an improviser, you're a comedian, you're an actress. You remind me of now you tell me who people think. Not not physically, no, not your looks, but you remind me like of a Sherry O'Terry. That's I used to get that all the time growing up. Right? Mm-hmm. Ever since I think junior high. Maybe it's just your height or your stature yeah, or something. Yeah. I think also, uh, I used to have more energy. I was like a spaz really, growing really? up. Yeah. Wow. But it, it's more, yeah, it's more your energy. And uh, I never met her, but you just remind me of her. Thank and, you. And also the way, um, just her, the way she improvises. Yeah. Yeah, you have that, how do you say it? Like that, what would you say? Like that essence or different improv actresses bring different things to the table. Yeah. Like you're not like Kate McKinnon. I mean, no. she's very talented. You're very talented, but it's a different mm-hmm. kind of thing. You guys can decide for yourself after you hear today's <laughs> story, because today, Jenna, you bring forth a topic, near death experience. Yes. And that's, you know, I, what I love about this topic is so clean. Mm-hmm. Like we know what you're going to talk about. Yeah. It, it's your near death experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So of course, this is going to be amazing. I feel like I've had near death experiences where I probably should have died, you know, like yes. hiking on a trail I shouldn't have been on or skiing down a, a, you know, skiing down a mountain I shouldn't have been on or, 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 you know, swimming out too far. But but the only time I ever felt like I really was going to die was in the ocean when I was about nine or ten, like tumbling in the waves. Oh wow! Like feeling like I was seeing my life flash before my very short, my very short <laughs> yes. life flash before my eyes. <laughs> like second grade, first grade. Yeah, exactly. That's scary, though. Yeah, yeah, it is scary. But but other than that, I haven't really had one. So I'm anxious to hear to hear your story. 
Actually, when I was thinking about that, that was when I used to go to Ocean City, New Jersey. We went there every mm-hmm. summer growing up because I'm from Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. And there's this new candle that's out right now. They're called Homesick Candles. Have you heard of these? Yes, I actually have. They're really cool. They're each personalized with either a different state or a different country. And they also actually have a lot of different college towns. These candles are like totally thoughtful and personal. It's not just like you picked up anything off the shelf. I mean, you think about the person and maybe a place they've been or someplace they met and then you buy them an appropriate candle. In fact, I got my mom one called Southern California, you know, so she can think of me. And here's the description of Southern California. A perfect mix of lemon and zesty oranges along with fresh sea breeze and aloe completed with a floral bouquet of rose, carnation, and jasmine. Doesn't that sound lovely? Yeah. So you can share memories with homesick candles that create and build strong bonds with your friends and family. It's perfect. It's personal. And everybody loves a good candle. And right now, you guys, story-worthy listeners who go to homesick.com and use my promo code STORYWORTHY will receive 10% off any order over $50 and get free shipping. I mean, that's a great deal. You get 10% off and free shipping. So you guys head over to homesick.com, use the promo code STORYWORTHY, Worthy, and you'll find a personal gift for everybody on your list. Are you doing this, Jenna? Yeah. Do you love candles? Yeah. I know, right? It makes a great gift. Anyway, you have so many great stories, Jenna. I know you do. So I want to hear your near-death experience story. But also, you told so many fantastic stories on Story Smash. Oh, thank you. I mean, about being a nanny in Hollywood mm-hmm. and about interviewing with Elon Musk. I mean, you have... Uh, like a lot in your quiver is that the is that how you say it yeah absolutely i think it just comes from always uh saying yes and getting into situations I want to get out of, which is kind of related to (laughs) this, today's theme. You are so funny. No, I know what you mean, though. It's like if you, the more you say yes, the more you might fail, but the more experiences you'll have. And so it's like quantity versus like doing nothing. Yeah, absolutely. I remember reading some quote. I used to live in New York after college and I saw this quote that was like the um, the morning after is for the storytellers. And there was something about saying yes. It was like some weird poem. And I was like, oh yeah, if you say yes, you're always going to end up having some sort of story. If you say no, you're never going to have a story. Yeah, exactly. And so, In other words, you have to, to experience to even get the story to begin mm-hmm. with. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, I mean, you could read all the books you want and watch mm-hmm. all the TV you want, but if it's, it's, not, it's not your story, mm-hmm. that's, that's, you know, you're watching Breaking Bad for the third time. Yes. And now Which, what? Oh, I just rewatched it. It holds up. Oh, it's still terrifying the second time around. <laughs> I know. Even it when is. you know what happens. It is. Hey, I want to show you this app on my phone, by the way. It's called Robin Hood. Have you heard of that? Robin um, Hood? No. I know of the legend, but not the app. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. And it's, it lets you buy and sell stocks, ETFs, and cryptos all commission-free. Really? Do you know what I just said? Yes. Do you? Do you know what an ETF is? Um, No. <laughs> But I know what um, <laughs> stocks are. No, exactly. And, and I need to start investing and like well, playing with that. Honestly, then this Robinhood.com, you should really, you're going to be really impressed because it's a non-intimidating way for stock market newcomers, especially, to yeah. invest for the first time. And you can be confident because it's like, it's just simple and it's intuitive. They use those matchstick charts. Do you know what I mean? So oh, can- like a. Like a bar graph? Yeah. Sort well, of? you call it a bar graph. Yeah. <laughs> I call it a matchstick graph. The point is that other brokerages charge up to $10 for every trade, but, but Robinhood, they don't charge commission fees at all. I need to try this. I know. It's amazing. Robinhood. So you really can steal from the rich and give to the poor financial planners like myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was going to tell you what an ETF is. Oh yeah. What is an ETF? Very similar to a mutual fund, but when you buy a mutual fund, they're processed at the exchange closing rate at the end of the day. Do you know what I mean? Like, so if you buy a mutual fund at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, it's mm-hmm. still not going to, we're not going to get that price locked into the end of the day. Mm-hmm. But with an ETF, they're kind of like mutual funds, but you can trade them anytime you want, like a regular stock. It's just another way to invest. Yeah. It's an ETF. That's what I was going to tell you about those, which I forgot earlier. That's cool, though. And it's all in one app, so you can keep track of it easily. Exactly, Robinhood. And so you guys got to head over there. And right now, Robinhood is going to give my listeners here at StoryWorthy a free stock like Apple, Ford, or Sprint. I know, right? And it will help build your portfolio. So sign up at storyworthy.robinhood.com. Storyworthy.robinhood.com, you guys. Storyworthy.robinhood.com and start investing in this really cool way. Yeah, so are you investing at all right now, Jenna Brister? Oh, no. 
You know, that's what's next though. That's what's yeah. next. It's a good thing to do. Yeah. I had a real job in my life for mm-hmm. seven years. Mm-hmm. And during that time, I um, put money into a 401k mm-hmm. and then, you know, and then that actually was a very good decision on my part mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> because then later I've been able to, to make it grow as yeah. it were. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so listen, I'm really excited to hear your story. But before we get to Jenna's story, I did want to remind you guys to head over to storyworthypodcast.com. And I'm just going to leave it at that because I've already been talking too much about, you know, stuff. So we're just going to leave it right there. All right, you guys, Jenna Brister's here right now. She's an actress and an improviser, like I said. And you're a five-time Moth Story Slam winner. Yes. What is happening? It's so fun. The band starts up. No. <laughs> whistling on a so sweet. Jenna, that is so wonderful. That's a really great accomplishment. Thank you. And you also write made-for-TV thriller movies for <laughs> Lifetime, which you're, now see, you're grinning right off the I bat. I am. I mean, because it's, because why? Because it's so fun. I I grew up watching Lifetime movies, yeah. that formulaic program yeah. where you know who the bad guy is because they're watching across the street. Right. And so I had no idea that, you know, working in comedy for so many years that my first movie to get made would be a Lifetime thriller. And what was the name of that? A Killer Twin. Oh, Killer Twin. Sure. Yeah, of course. It seems like they <laughs> may have done that before. Yes. Well, it was originally The Deadly Double oh, and then I they see. changed it. Yeah. Because there's generally only about, what, 12, 14 stories there? Yeah, exactly. And then they go through them. They keep going through Psycho them. Nanny, Crazy yeah. Babysitter. Another thing I learned about those movies, uh, recently I had Melissa Peterman on the show. She um, is shooting a Lifetime movie and she was saying how they shoot the entire script 120 pages in 10 days yeah they do they're usually 100 because of the network wow they're, they have to be exactly 100 pages and same they shot mine in vancouver in 10 days that's what she's doing right now she's that's shooting awesome. in vancouver good for 10 days. oh that's so rad Isn't they pump funny? them out it's really yeah. cool it's the same crew that do the hallmark movies yeah she said that they're very co- accomplished mm-hmm. like the people that are working these films because they do it so much and so fast yeah they really do that's so cool she's up there though that's yeah. awesome yeah and also jenna you are now the co-host of wondery's podcast i survivor so that's happening yes and you guys can find jenna over on twitter at jenna brister and also on instagram at jenna dot brister yeah that was good Nailed to it. get Jen- Jenna Dot Brister. Yeah. Because well, Jenna Brister was gone, obviously. It was by me. I, I somehow I got locked out of my own account, so I opened up another one. Oh, my gosh. I know. You are the I don't owner know. of two. <laughs> Wait, yeah. Did you call Instagram? I did. I emailed them, and I was like, please, it's me. And, and they, they, I, they never wrote. Yeah. Isn't that unbelievable? It is. Anyway, all right, I'm going to go check out Jenna Brister and Jenna Dot Yeah, right <laughs> you'll now, find so some, do. some nice old photos. <laughs> all right, you guys, wherever you are, put your hands together for the lovely and talented Jenna Brister. Woo! Thank you so much for having me Yay. on Hello Story Worthy People. I uh, come to you today with a tale that I haven't actually told in a long while. It's a story of a near-death experience. I had just turned 18 and I was barely legal and I got asked to go work on staff at a Bible camp in Washington. And so I grew up going to summer camps and uh, my camp director was moving to a new camp, but I was excited to take a summer off. You know, I was 18. A bunch of my friends had cool internships. We're going to travel abroad, um, probably have sex with people. But I got roped into working at a a camp outside um, um, this town called Bremerton in Seattle. And so it was on a lake because uh, you might know Christians love lakes for some reason, because I think it's easy to <laughs> baptize people. <laughs> That's my theory. Um, but I, I, I was convinced to go because uh, my camp director... Uh, came to me and he was like, look, I need you to come be the drama director uh, and this at this new camp. And it's going to be a Lord of the Rings themed extreme sports Bible camp. And I was like, wow, that sounds incredible. And I'd never seen Lord of the Rings. And he was like, look, I want you to um, come be the drama director and act in all these dinner theater plays for the campers. It's this huge camp um, and you're going to play Gimli. And so I was like, all right, fine, fine. I'll, I'll come to camp one last summer. And then after watching Lord of the Rings, I discovered that Gimli was the bearded dwarf. So I had been precast as a bearded dwarf. And I'm five feet tall, so I figured, okay, let's do it. So I pack up everything and I head to summer camp. And this camp is huge. It had 150 people on staff, 300 campers. And we all file into the main dining hall for the first staff meeting. And I know no one there except for the camp director. And he informs me that I have to start calling him Yeah Yeah because everyone there had a camp name. And so we all go in and I stood up and meet everyone and he, for the naming ceremony. And so I have to say a few details about myself. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm into, you know, hiking. I like to do this and that. And then someone named Squeegee Boom stands up. 
And he's like, your life seems like a buffet table of insanity. I name you Smorgasbord. So everyone claps. And now for the rest of the summer, I'm called Smorgasbord. It was the weirdest thing ever. And so I move into the staff girl's cabin out in the woods. And there's 20 other, uh, you know, young adult females living in there. And then this bitch named Twingo comes up to me and she's like, the only reason you're here is because Sassafras got pregnant. And I was like, what? Okay. And so I'm like unpacking my thrift store clothes into my bunk. And then I meet who will be my best friend, Blue Crush, the water sports director. She is the most high maintenance person at camp. She has like dyed bleach blonde hair. She has an oscillating fan next to her bunk, caboodles from Target, um, lipstick. And so she's in charge of, you know, she's like the head lifeguard of the place. And she's actually wearing one of those, uh, you know, those, uh, orange floaties, like the can, the lifeguard can. She wore it all summer. And she's total opposites. And we became instant best friends because we both loved sneaking out at night and going to Taco Bell. And we both hated Twingo. So one of those first nights, she was like, smorgasbord, let's go for a drive. And I was like, all right. And she taught me how to smoke cloves. And I was like, this is the coolest girl ever. She was older. You know, she was like in her 20s. And I was like, she's amazing. And so the first week of camp was inner city week where they bus in a bunch of kids from the inner city. And none of them either, like me, had seen Lord of the Rings. And so all of them just called me the caveman because I had to wear this chainmail outfit and a giant beard and this huge wig, and I, it was so hot, but they were really committed to this Lord of the Rings theme. So a typical day at camp looked like this. There would be, you know, Lord of the Rings themed crafts, games, swimming in at the waterfront, and I would always go down and hang out with Blue Crush because I wasn't in charge of any campers normally. I would just put on plays during dinner. So I would help uh, Blue Crush pull in this thing called the blob at night. And if you've seen heavyweights, you know, uh, the blob is this enormous inflatable pillow that's like 20 feet long it goes on the lake and you climb up a tower and the idea it's like a physics nightmare um because you put a smaller person on the end of it in the water and then a large person jumps off a tower on one end slams into it and then it shoots the little person off into the lake and so I often was forced to go on the other side of it. And they're like, smorgasbord, get on the end, get on the end. <laughs> and, you know, like, um, oh, my friend Donkey Kong, who played Gimli, he was a really tall, lanky Canadian man. He would launch me, um, you know, my best friend Oneater, who was a this six foot four, half black, half Cuban man who became also one of my instant best friends. He would launch me. But he was super fun because he had a digital camera and I had the key to the costume closet. So once um, we started uh, doing these things at night, because like this is how you flirt. Like I wasn't, I was very asexual this summer. Um, but this is how you flirt at camp. It's like you decide to meet at night at the kitchen and you do a kitchen raid. We go in and like eat all the desserts. And then we would go to the costume closet and I would unlock it because I had a key to it. And we would just dress up in different costumes and take photos of each other. And like that was my summer. It was very odd. And so the blob itself would get vandalized at night. Like other teenagers would, from across the lake would swim over and slash it open with a knife. So at night we started pulling it up onto the field. And so that was just a routine thing. You know, after lights out, all the campers would go to their cabins and then I would join Blue Crush down at the waterfront. And we'd pull the blob up, light up a clove and go to Taco Bell. Like that was our life. And, um, but it was really weird. Like the people there were not typical uh church going people like there were a handful of people who were really cool but some of them were like really really mean i mean i mentioned twingo earlier she was like so mean like i'm talking regina george of bible camp and one night in the cabin uh i remember this girl um it wasn't i, I don't want to say her real name in case anyone from camp uh listens to this we'll just call her salt and peppa was explaining to the rest of us in the cabin that she's still a virgin because her and her boyfriend who was also on staff there teen wolf uh only did anal and i was like no no that's not how it works um you're definitely not a virgin and she's like yeah anal doesn't count and i was like what is going on like why are all of you working here none of you should be working here and then Lever 2000, one of the lifeguards, comes out of our one shared shower in the cabin and announces that she just shaved her pubes because she was going to have a date that weekend. I was like, I'm done. I'm done. I'm over this. I'm over this camp. And so, um, but, but yeah, yeah, 
the director was great. He's like super loving and probably one of the funniest people I've ever met. He's like this 220 pound Puerto Rican from Queens. He reminds me so much of Vince Vaughn. And so I was having fun with him and with Blue Crush and a few of our friends. So we had five of the guys who led the extreme sports like BMX bike stuff dress up as ring wraiths. Those like guys in Lord of the Rings land or Mordor in all black robes. And they would like drive around the campers and they'd be like, yeah. And then we would get 300 donuts from Krispy Kreme and those would be the rings. Like It was a very hodgepodge, but I was like, let's lean into the theme, whatever. And so one night... I started to get riskier with my shenanigans. And so I stole a bunch of the bubbles from the rec closet. And I met Oneater down at the waterfront. And we poured all the bubbles on the slide and would shoot down into the water. And then we decided, we were like, let's let's paddle out on one of these boats and just sleep in a boat. You know, and I was like, oh my gosh, maybe we'll kiss. Who knows? Probably not. But I was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's sleep out on the lake. Because I was just so emotionally over camp at this point because everyone was crazy. And, um... So we go back to our cabins, get our sleeping bags, and I'm wearing this blue tankini from Target, like powder blue tankini, and like I'm full body confidence for no reason. You know, living off camp food, you know, hadn't had a proper BM in two months. And we go down to the waterfront, and Blue Crush is there smoking cloves. So we light up, and we're about to paddle out to sleep on the lake, and um, we hear voices by the boathouse, and we're like, what? Like, no one else is supposed to be out here. It's like midnight. And so we creep through the bushes. And of course, Oneida freaks out because he just left a cabin of third graders sleeping alone in the woods. And so I go with Blue Crush and, we're, and we see that it's Kavu, the maintenance man, and Donkey Kong, the activities director, and Yeah Yeah, the camp director. And they're playing on the blob. Because if you're a grown male, you know, in the 150 to 200 pound weight class, one of you can kind of sit on the end and then the other one hits the other side and it kind of bounces you up. And they're like, smorgasbord, get on the end, get on the end. And so I was like, yeah, you know, I'll get on the end because it's midnight and, and, you know, I'm making seven cents an hour. Like, what's the worst that can happen? And so I remember Blue Crush goes with me to the end of the blob and she lays down the floaty just beyond where I was laying as if I could, you know, jump up and like land on it and it would break my fall. And then around the back, yeah, yeah, Kavu and Donkey Kong without communicating. And I remember laying there and thinking, what's the worst that could happen to me? Like, this is fine. I'm at, I'm at Bible camp. You know, everything's cool. And so at the same time, I'm thinking, I need to not do this and stand up because I can get severely injured. Because it hurts being launched in a lake, landing on water. And so it's going to hurt a lot more landing on a field of dirt and grass. But before I had time to stand up, at the same time, Donkey Kong, Kavu, and Yaya, yeah, who all combined weigh about 600 pounds, run and slam into the back of the blob and I feel all the air well up underneath me and I am launched and I take off from it and I'm in sort of a fetal position as I fly over Blue Crush who was about you know six feet ahead of me and I hit a branch that we measured later that was about 12 feet in the air and I'm up in the air long enough to think oh my gosh, this is going to jack me up. And I'm starting, I'm twisting in midair and I realize I'm going to land on like my left shoulder. And so my first thought was, okay, protect my neck and my rib cage. And so I remember seeing this safety video that if you're ever in a elevator that's plummeting, you're supposed to lay flat on the ground so that the shock is absorbed throughout your whole body. So I did my best job of trying to contort myself midair so that I wouldn't land on my head and potentially, you know, snap my neck. And I landed with a huge thud right along my left side. And I made these sounds that I had never made before that were a mix of like, it was kind of like this, like, "Ah, ah," of like my lungs trying to catch my breath. And everyone starts screaming and Blue Crush is freaking out. She's like, we need to backboard her. But um, they all ran around and then sat me up which was horrible. And then they called Teaspoon the nurse who was across camp. And her name was Teaspoon, but her real name was Teresa Spoon. So that one was valid. And she comes down (laughs) in her Dodge Caravan. And without backboarding me, they pick me up and put me into the van. And I said, I can't move. I can't walk. And I really can't even speak yet. I, I, I was in so much shock and so much pain. And 
They drive me up to the nurse's station and Teaspoon had all these Canadian painkillers that she had smuggled in. And so she's loading me full of pills. And there's this camper. I remember Brooks, like a sixth, sixth grader who had just broken his arm. So he's in the bed uh, across the, ca- the nurse's station. And I'm, the side of my body is turning purple. And I, it, hurt, it hurt so hard to breathe. And I was like, I, I need to go to a hospital. And they had, so Teaspoon does a brief physical exam on me and determines that my left arm isn't broken. And I was like, okay, well, that's nice. Uh, I can't move. And so then they, you know, yeah, yeah, I was freaking out. Everyone's crying. And he promises me, you know, Justin Timberlake tickets and all this stuff. And I was like, I, I just really need to go to a hospital. And they wouldn't take me because they were afraid that they would get sued. And so I, you know, everyone leaves the cabin and I'm sitting there. It's probably two in the morning by now. And I'm in so much pain. And I look over and Brooks is just laying there with his broken arm. And I was like, I have to, I have to call my dad. And so my parents, my childhood home is about three hours from here. And there's a rotary phone on the nightstand. And I pick it up and I just dial. And it's two in the morning. And so I, and I wake up my parents. And I'm like, Dad, uh, there's this thing called the blob. It's in heavyweights. You know, I tried to explain to him that I got launched on dry land on this giant pillow and that I couldn't move. And he's like, I'll be right there. And so he drives three hours around the peninsula and gets to Bible camp as the sun's rising. And I remember I tried to walk out to his truck and it still was like so painful on the entire left side of my body. And so he drives me to the hospital that I was born in and they take x-rays and I had cracked six ribs and my pelvis. And, and it was so, and I had bruises all along the side of my body. And so they pumped me full of drugs and, and I went home and I took a week off of camp and I was like, dad, I cannot go back to Bible camp. That place is bad. Everyone there is bad. And that week coincided with the DVD release of seasons one and two of Lost. And so watching that on Oxycod was so fun because I would have these nightmares at night of like the smoke monster and Saeed busting into my room and Echo was in my dreams. It was so crazy. But my car was at Bible camp and it was getting towards the end of the summer and I was like, oh God, I'm going to go back to, to college. I got to go get my car. And my arm was in a sling. And I, so my dad drove me back across and dropped me off. And I, I was surprised to see that they had one of <laughs> this other like young guy. Um, I think it was like Aslan. That was his name. Uh, playing Gimli. And there were all these rumors going around about what happened to Smorgasbord. And they're like, oh, she got sick. Oh, she had, to, she had to go to something else. And no one had told the truth about what happened to me. And Blue Crush was pissed, of course, because she was like my one ally. And so on my last day, there was this big staff meeting because a lot of people were leaving, you know, and there were some new people coming in for the last few weeks of the summer. And they had a naming ceremony. And so I was like, all right, this is it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell. I'm going to do the big tell. I'll blow the lid off this place. And... Then Blue Crush comes in and she's like, someone slashed the blob open, you know? And apparently my arrival coincided with someone slashing it open. And yeah, yeah, pulls me aside and he's like, did you, did you do that? And I was like, no, I wish I would have thought of that. But you know, you guys shouldn't use that thing anymore. It's super dangerous. And then he stands up in front of the entire staff and he comes clean. He's like, you know, smorgasbord was basically land blobbed and that's how she got injured. And I appreciated him coming clean to everyone, you know, because I wouldn't have sued anyways. I just wanted, you know, prompt medical care. And, of course, the bones healed and everything. But that day, a new staff member arrived. And after telling that story, he stood up and we named him Land Blob in my honor. And the last I heard, Land Blob is still on staff there. And so my big, biggest takeaway from that was uh, nothing good happens after midnight, and don't trust anyone who claims to be an adult virgin because they're probably doing anal. And uh, never go to Bible camp if you don't want to. I hate those people. Yeah, it was bad. I swear to God, Jenna, I hate those people. They are like the most unchristian people I've ever heard of. There was a lot of bad ones. My camp director and his family are amazing, but they're, the, they're a few well, of the only wh- ones. When did the Bible or Jesus or anything like that, when did it even play into camp? Usually in the afternoon they would do like Bible study things or like activities that had to do with the Bible or like Bible study. And we would do these fireside skits that would have like loose biblical themes. But what was most shocking was 
everything behind closed doors. Like I remember most of these staff members having one-on-one conversations with them and being like, you're rude. Like you're not a good person. A lot of them were, but the fact that there were even a handful that weren't was enough to ruin it for me. Uh, Was Sassafras really pregnant? Oh yeah. I guess someone got pregnant and then, uh, Twingo, that's her real camp name. Uh, she made a point on my first day of telling me that I wouldn't be there if, if she hadn't gotten pregnant. And I was like, what? And that was the kind of tipped me off to the fact that, oh, maybe not everyone here is like living a life of love and acceptance and inclusion. Yeah. And were there Bibles there? Yeah. Yeah. People Did would bring people their own Bibles. And Did people read them? Good question. I don't know. I really don't. Was Blue Crush, was that girl a oh, lot she's older? Great. Yeah, she was in her, I think probably in her mid to late 20s at the time. So why wouldn't she call the hospital? Or what, why, uh, why weren't they calling your parents like ASAP? Yeah, no, and that's what was most disturbing, you know, is that, that I wasn't rushed to a hospital. I think they were afraid of, I don't know what they were afraid of. It's not like, you know, I would lead a crusade to shut the camp down. You yeah, know, but, I, but, but things have to be known. I mean, yeah. I feel like you're not necessarily a crusade, but like... People need to know that rules aren't being followed mm-hmm. in the event of an emergency situation. Yeah. And that just because my arm's not broken doesn't mean everything else was, wow. you know, it, it was, that was the worst. That yeah. is so terrifying. It you was. You were flying through the air oh. and knew you were going to land and it was like, how bad's it going to be? Yeah. I had enough time in the air to think, yeah. okay, I need to figure out how I'm going to land. So when it they, was so painful. when they run over to you, what are they saying? Yeah. They're like, like, are you okay? No, are you okay? Right, you're okay. Right. It was a lot of that. A lot of like, please they don't. Saying, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Were yeah. they saying that? Yeah. So everyone felt deep remorse, but it was definitely not handled well. Like I never should have been moved. I never yeah. should have been picked up at that yeah, point. Of course. You know? And if the phone was sitting there the whole time, I can't believe nobody was calling your parents. Yeah, I think no one wanted to believe that it could have been wor- worse. There's a lot of that feeling yeah. like, oh, well, this can't be that bad. But then you even said, I want to go to the hospital, and they just said go to sleep it'll go away yeah yeah boy oh boy i don't know that's really upsetting I, i'm terror i'm not gonna let my daughter go anywhere yeah well first of all i would never make her go to a bible game. yeah oh well, i'm never going back but honestly <laughs> i i want i hope that she would call me as well or, or or have the sense to think that somebody needs help yeah and it's dangerous and I'm, i know the camp itself i think it's shut down since now i think there was some sort of health code violation no kidding because also that summer and i, I don't put this part in the story but everyone got wicked sick um it's i want to say it's like that hand and mouth hand and foot disease where uh, there was some sort of like feces yeah everyone was barfing and it looked like some sort of like concentration camp kids were laid out in the field on mattresses throwing up everywhere when you were there yeah because i guess they were like the ducks were pooping in the lake and everyone's swimming and like just basically drinking duck poop and then yeah and i was like i think that's what ended up shutting the camp down i'd have to double check yeah but it was one of those things i was like Oh, that is unbelievable. I'm over it. I'm and over yeah, it. And yeah, yeah, the director, had she been there forever? Or oh, he, he, no, that was his first summer. His first there. summer. And he, he and I used to be at the same camp with a lot of our friends throughout high school. And he's so funny. So and he's like the best. He's the one who came clean in the end. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean. And he's, he's. Did he ever say, I can't believe I didn't call your parents. I wasn't thinking. I think probably. Yeah. I think we all agreed after that. Like, okay, that should have been handled different. But uh, he was so funny. I I remember he, I think the first thing he did was like, promise me in sync tickets. And I was like, okay, he knows me. But yeah, yeah. I guess. I don't know. I'm just still so mad at them all. Yeah, it was, it was tough. It it was really tough. I should have left earlier. I think that's what was hard about that summer, you know, and the idea of just, being at summer camp all summer, you know, it's something I did growing up, but at a certain point, it's like, oh man, I need to get away Especially from this. Especially at 18, because those kids yeah. are like, like I did summer camp at 15. For, yeah. I was a camp counselor for what they called fresh air camps. And okay. So that was inner city kids. And a week at a time, we'd have these kids. And, um, uh, but it was much more innocent. You yeah. Know I mean, I think the, 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 there wasn't anybody over, you know, the kids, I think they maybe up to eighth grade. Okay. You know, so it sounds like your camp was like, uh, well, what what age yeah. were the kids? Um, anywhere. I think the youngest was fourth grade. They would ever be, oh, and there are different weeks throughout the summer, and then I up see. through high school. But something I also noticed at a lot of these camps was how many people would get injured. Oh, we'd play God. night games, and no matter what, someone's breaking a leg or an arm or a collarbone. And I remember being like, "What? This is strange to me. Yeah. Like, why is everyone getting injured? We're at camp. 
You know, I don't know. I don't think that kids should be put yeah. in situations where they well, can't they get even have a nurse's office at that camp. They had a cabin. a ca- Yeah. A, a nurse's station. Yeah. You know, and it's she was cool. Thing. Teaspoon was really cool. But I think it was just so mishandled. It just sounds very crazy. And then the whole Lord of the Rings thing. On oh, top of it. I just, it's like too many things happening. It adds this whole other layer. Yeah. That people were dressed up like Lord of the Rings characters. And we had to wear these chainmail felt outfits. And this lady who made them, oh my gosh, she was like one of the counselor's moms. And she was also a complete psychopath. I think she fashioned herself some sort of professional costume person, which she was. They were really pro. But I remember she was also super kind of kind of snarky. Yeah. You know, I was like, what is up with these people? Like, yeah. what's in the water yeah. here? Do you have brothers and sisters? I do. Did any of them ever go to that camp? They didn't. Thank goodness. No. Yeah. And I, yeah, I didn't. I think most of my friends who work there they didn't go back i think that was that was the last one yeah hey i want to tell you guys about my new sponsor noom n-o-o-m and most people who lose weight gain it all back why well because most weight loss plans just tell you what to do while you're on the plan but not after well there's this new app called noom and it's not a lose weight fast plan it's more like lose weight for good plan It's a thinking person's diet. You don't have to be a celebrity to have your own support team or your own glam squad. I mean, Noom is right there with their coaches. They've got nutrition experts, fitness trainers, and it's all in one app. And they work with you personally to recognize and change your habits that might be blocking your success. So you learn how to eat, how to move. So it's not dieting. It's learning how to change your lifestyle. And it's right there on the phone whenever and wherever you need it. I mean, we're all strapped for time, but Noom just asks that you commit 10 minutes a day. That's it. So what do you have to lose? Sign up today to start your trial at Noom.com slash story. That's Noom.com slash story. Start your trial today at Noom.com slash story and start losing weight for good. Honestly, you guys, you're going to see life changing results and you're going to be happy I told you about this. All right, you guys, I got to wrap it up right about now. I want to thank you so much for tuning in. Head over to Twitter and tell Jenna that you enjoyed her story. Tweet her over there at Jenna Brister. And then follow me too at Storyworthy. That would be fantastic. And on behalf of all the sponsors on the show today, thank you so much, you guys. Because when you support my sponsors, then you're supporting me and my child. Yes, she keeps wanting to eat. I don't yes. Know. It just never stops. All right, and one more time on behalf of you, Jenna Brister, thank you so much. Thank you for having really me. This is so fun. It. My name is Christine Blackburn saying, make it a story worthy week. Thanks for joining us on the Story Worthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories. Subscribe to Story Worthy on iTunes and visit the Story Worthy website at storyworthypodcast.com. Membership fees apply after free trial. Cancel any time. Can I be real for a second? That goal you have to exercise and eat better, you really can do it. But nobody is going to do it for you. And nobody has to because you can do it if you have the right tools and a community that cares about helping you get results. And that's us, Beachbody. It's as convenient as your TV or laptop, but you need to decide that you're worth it. Let us help you succeed. Here's how. Go to Beachbody.com to claim your free membership and start feeling great. This week on RVER, sponsored by Progressive Insurance. I'm sorry, I can't operate on that vehicle. But doctor, you took an oath. That RV, it's my son's RV. Oh, doctor, isn't there anything you can do? I'm not a miracle worker, Sheila. I'm an RV surgeon, trained to save the lives of large injured recreational vehicles, which is definitely a real profession. When your RV really needs saving, Progressive has you covered. See if you could save with a leader in RV insurance. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates covered subject to policy terms.